Welcome back to the AEC Hive, where we're talking about innovation in architecture, engineering, and construction. I'm Ralph Montague, director at ArcDocs and co-founder of the AEC Hive. I'm joined by my fellow co-founder, John Egan. John, do you want to say hi to everyone? Hi, everyone. This is John Egan, the CEO at BIM Launcher um, and co-founder at AEC Hive. I'm looking forward to a really great discussion here today with Neil Thompson um, we've been trying to get this in the diary for quite some time so yeah thanks thanks Neil for joining us. So we're very excited today to be joined by as John said Neil Thompson from the UK. Neil is a director of digital construction at SNC Lavalin Atkins and he's also head of the CIH program at the Centre for Digital Built Britain. So Neil, maybe you could give us a little bit of background about yourself and your roles at Atkins and the CDDB just to get started. Sure, yeah, I, I guess, you know, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. So uh, I have, a, I guess I have a handful of things that I do. So um, the, the, the majority of my time is leading the Construction Innovation Hub program at the Centre for Digital Built Britain, which is a nice collaboration collection of, of, of acronyms. So if you hear CDBB and CIH, that's Construction Innovation Hub and the Centre for Digital Britain. And um, there I look after the digital aspect of that programme. So a few years ago, the government, the UK government made a commitment to investing money into the construction industry around the innovation of the sector digital transformation, the application of manufacturing techniques into the sector. And we work on lots of interesting projects, you know, on, on one end of the scale, we're creating and researching the connectivity of data and sensors and looking at how you build smart assets of the future looking at a thing called a platform construction system so that's you know platform systems like you know you go onto the volvo or the audi website and you can configure yourself a car on the internet and essentially press order and one one turns up almost um you know how, how can we achieve the same for the construction industry how can we create a sort of this platform around cons configurators and allow the supply chain to to operate in that type of to, type of world and you know all the way through to you know we've got things like interoperability is a really hot topic in in the industry you know allowing technology to communicate with each other with minimal friction is a a key area i mean we do lots of things but that's just just a few to give you a sense of flavor so that's 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 one that's the sort of the majority of my time another part of my time within atkins is looking at the essentially the organizational transformation internally from making sure it's you know we're, we're using the latest in technology and being efficient and then on the other side of that is advising clients on how they can do the same you know, using technology to be more efficient, looking at processes, looking at organizational design and commercial design and all that type of stuff. And then lastly, in that commercial design space, I also have a, an honorary associate professor position at the, the Bartlett a Construction and Project Management School at the University College London. Um, and that's where I get to play around with yeah, the, the, the economic of, of digital marketplaces and how that applies to the uh, construction sector. So yeah, lots of things and happy to have a walk around any of those. Well, I mean, that's fantastic. And it's it's really a pleasure to have you here because you, I suppose, have been at the cutting edge of innovation for a long time. I think we met initially in, was it 2013 when you came over to Dublin? We mm. we were trying to get people interested in BIM at that stage. <laughs> we had a meet the experts event and you were one of the honored speakers there. It was fantastic to hear what you're doing. and. And since, I mean, you've, your career has been, as I said, at the cutting edge of innovation in oh, design firms with, with companies like BDP, um, within construction companies like Balfour BT. Um, you've you've also were one of the founders, I think, of the, the Dot Built Environment, which was a, a young leadership group looking at innovation in the sector. And of course, as you mentioned there, your, your work with um, UCL, et cetera. So innovation is obviously in your blood <laughs> um, and and what you're really excited about and doing. And that's been the, the kind of overriding theme of what we're trying to achieve in AEC Hive is get people talking about innovation because as a sector in general, it's involved in building the, the built environment and the built mm. world. And so on one hand, it is constantly involved in innovation. And yet when it comes to formally pursuing 
research, development, innovation, investment uh, of time and money into that seems to be quite low. What's your feeling? Is that would that be your sense of the industry in general? I mean, obviously, there's pockets of expertise that are mm. doing great things, but in general, people are just kind of getting on with doing stuff the way they did for the last 20, 30 years, and you know, not really actively pursuing new ways of working. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think I, I see it down two two ends of the same telescope, I guess, to, to use a cliche, is, and it's separating the innovation of the things that we build and the innovation around what I, what I call sort of the work about work. I think if we look, if we step back as far as we can and look at the industry, I think we're probably one of the most innovative industries, um, and that may you may gasp, um, because like look at the things that we build, build great things. Despite what you think of things like Crossrail, we've managed to build, you know, a railway under London with relatively minimal impact in 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 the grand scheme of things, and in comparing it to to previous construction type projects. And I just think of some of the projects I've I've worked on to to highlight some, you know, tra- mm-hmm. transforming the um the London Olympic Stadium to West Ham Stadium. Despite all the things that happened around it, the things that the innovation in terms of solving really difficult problems is 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 what we do and i think that's the that's the interesting thing about the engineering that we do we we like we like a bit of firefighting we love solving those bigger problems i think we do a really good job of that and when those things are done well like like with a lot of innovation actually if, if it's done well it sort of it creeps up on us it's quite silent and changes things and you can only see it when you step back and think oh well these things happened and that's 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 really interesting and do those lessons learned transfer into um well, I mean, this is this to is the rest this of the is, industry, yeah. or, and this yeah. is where I, I guess this does is, everybody walk away and say, "Oh, that was great," you know, and go on to the next challenge, and yeah, you know, the well, lesson gets left behind. <laughs> exactly. So you're you're now getting onto my where you know what could be better is the work about work. So you know, we all we get together, we build a great thing, we learn a load of stuff, and then those you know, project based. We're a project-based industry. A lot of our organisations are project-based organisations. So we sort of you know we grow and expand and contract depending on the sort of ebb and flow of project activity and it's you know we talk about all these big firms and small firms in in the industry but we you know we don't count the separate companies essentially that are created to build these things right so when we get into the well how do we go about doing this from a human interaction perspective it's I think that's where our experience of the industry day to day is the bit that seems dysfunctional is because you know we haven't found effective ways of knowledge management we haven't found effective ways of collaborating over a long period of time you know collaboration in the sense of getting in a room and solving a problem we're good at that but when you're when you increase the complexity and the the temporal element of it when it's outside of a thing that you can solve in one meeting it breaks down because of a few reasons one is let's just get commercial incentivization out of the way now because it, it you know the the way that we're paid and the way that we uh, we show that work is done doesn't quite align with the outcomes that we're trying to achieve you know one of the things that I give examples to people all the time is look uh, the way that we design and the purposes that we design hasn't shifted from essentially creating instructions for humans on paper you know if you if, if you type construction 2020 into google images i guarantee you one the first you know let's 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 let's, let's give it a go shall we construction <laughs> construction change uh, okay so the first picture you'll see with humans in shall we say that isn't logos it will be you know interestingly it's moved on so we've still got you know, a group of men wearing high vis, high hats. They're wearing masks, which is interesting. So the, the, the images have changed, but guess what? They're all hunching over, pointing at paper. So mm. there we go. We still haven't moved on. What's this this one is they're pretty much the same. Yeah, you know, it's all all men leaning over bits of paper. So that is 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 where what we're 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 trying to change. It's not necessarily the paper bit. We're not here to make yeah. I think this whole paperless office thing is a bit of a dis- bit of an unhelpful distraction, but it's the um, you know moving away from. It's not just about humans communicating with humans. It's it's how do we throw automation and machines and software into that mix? So there's there is this sort of machine to machine communication dimension that we 
tend to forget about when we talk about, you know, especially when we talk about standardization, you know, a lot of the standardization elements are still about that human to human communication element. It's still mm. for me lacking in that whole, well, how do we get machines to communicate with each other? And is, is it maybe that, um, like, it's interesting that you word, used the word communication because, you know, like, I think when people think about innovation and especially in, in terms of digitization, you know, they they forget about that it's about communication because that's effectively mm. what we're trying to do is get information from point A to point B, you know, in communication and in a way that, you know, point B understands it in the way point A intended it to be understood. Because mm. <laughs> uh, that, you know, if it's not understood in the way it was intended to be understood, then communication hasn't happened if even though there's been a transfer of information. Mm. Yeah, so correct understanding and you know I don't, I don't think people think about ICT and digitization and you know software and computers and in terms of in those terms you know that, but that is effectively it's technologies that are supporting in, in enhanced communications and this to is, get things it, done, done done better and this is one of the things that I'm probably going to cause a, you know say if this is a cardinal sin of our digital transformation communication but you know, one of the things I find a bit grating sometimes is when people say, oh, it's not about technology, it's about people and process. And it's like, well, yes, it's one of my things is most of the technologies exists, you know, the issues that we have about implementing the technology is process and culture driven. But we can't ignore the fact that it, it's the te it's the capability of the technology that, that enables what we're trying to do. So you know, one of the things I say is, well, let's all go back to typewriters. If, 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 if technology isn't a consideration, let's just go back to typewriters because technology isn't important. That's where, you know, that's where that whole thing breaks down. And I think it's the trying to create this distance from technology when we're thinking about things is actually quite unhelpful. And the, the other part is then, you know, for those that are technology focused is focusing on the, oh, we've got a technology and we're trying to shoehorn it into something or problem that doesn't quite exist. So is how we talk about those uh, aspects is is really key. But anyway, it's just a just a, just a share on on that because I think we're reaching a level of need in terms of the complexity where we do have to mature the conversation around technology because I think it's I think at this moment in time that's that's a key a key barrier. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what stops a lot of people when they think about technology is well. We've proved the point that we can build stuff without technologies for thousands of years, you know. So, you know, so why is it necessary to to use technology if we can do it without technology? So, but of course, I think you you point you picked on the, the the important point there is the need, the complexity, and the need has grown so much mm. to a point that the industry is not meeting the need. I mean, we have a, I'm sure you have similar issues in the UK, but in in Ireland where we would consider ourselves a first world country the industry is not meeting the needs of society we like we not we can't build enough housing to to support society we, we don't have enough education facilities we don't mm. have a, enough healthcare facilities i mean this whole covid crisis and all the lockdowns that we've experienced and the the disruption to our economy and all that all comes down to the fact that we don't have enough healthcare facilities to treat people and that's why we have to lock people away so they don't interact with each other because we, we don't have the healthcare facilities, even though we consider ourselves a first world country. So it's clear that the industry is unable to meet the, the demands and the needs of a first world society. And that's not even speaking about the vast need of the rest of the world for facilities. And so, yes, you can build buildings without technology, but it takes long, it's expensive, and there's a lot of waste and so just because you can do it without technology doesn't mean you should yeah and it's 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 and i think one of the things that i find quite interesting when looking back at different the histories of different industrial sectors is you know i find fascinating the out so the outcome of the automotive industry in the sense of you know the automotive industry has done great things in terms of it's made the accessibility of the automobile cheap and reliable the problem is uh, being being pointed towards the uh, now enabling the maximum number of people to own a car 
that is reliable has meant that we have this unintended consequence of massive amounts of congestion on our roads and essentially an ecological disaster from the emissions of those vehicles. And I think we kind of have a, a hidden aspect of that in the built environment. I mean, if we look at the carbon impact in both an embodied and emissions perspective of, of our industry, it's, it's almost just as disastrous. And it's how do we, and it's going back to what we were saying in, in the original part of the conversation is about, you know, we do put clever people in rooms and we fix really difficult problems. How do we focus those brains to to do a couple of things? One is don't fix, don't just fix the problem that's immediately in front of you. Let's, you know, how do you how do you fix the broader systems that that problem sits in? So you know, there's there's a system of ecology, sustainability, and carbon. There's a whole system of economy, welfare, and people. And then within in and then deeper in that, there's the aspects of materials and benefits in terms of their, you know, I suppose it's the same as sustainability, but there's the the performance of those materials and how we how we go about set the dials right. And uh, and I guess and sorry to step back again is it's the curation of all those different elements together to to solve to solve these problems on on the ground. Because as you could imagine, you turn up to a building site. And you know, people are just trying to get whatever they're working on project-wise, get that piece of work done for the day. They're not necessarily mm-hmm. interested in the carbon impact or the well-being impact of the thing that they're putting together in 30 years' time. So it's we have to do something. So yeah. I haven't got any answers, but that's what we need to do. <laughs> well, it's, it's probably some clues. And while you were speaking there, I was, I, was, I was just going back to the image that you put in my mind of oldish, burly men sort of hovering over some drawings you know as a as a image of of the industry probably because those men have some experience and knowledge in their minds and that there's no other way to access them but by a group of them getting together in a room and and sort of looking at a drawing together (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, which and that's that's the outdated picture so firstly so why is it only middle-aged to older men with sort of strength in labor that are sort of the picture of this industry when of course it should be a much broader group of people that have interesting things that they can bring to the industry and uh, maybe that brings uh, could bring us on to the work you did with the built Dot environment because built environment. that that was quite interesting at the time you you were trying to encourage and attract um a much broader group of particularly younger people like mm. to to say to younger people this is actually a fascinating industry to to get into tell us a bit about that because that i think that sort of yeah, o- that, opened up the uh, the industry to to people who maybe would have younger people might have said who wants to join just construction it's just a dirty muddy place for yeah. uh, middle-aged men I, I i guess this is sort of back in the days of the the i guess the, the original bim task group and there was a, a a question to that stakeholder group around you know there's a lot of things that you're doing to enable industry and their interfaces are with the senior members of that of the industry like what 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 you're doing about like everybody else you know there, there's the aspect of um allowing you know we'll record young or early professionals in the industry to have because they're the ones that are going to have to implement the things that they're putting together what are you doing about that and i think <laughs> uh, i summarize the answer with well, you've nominated yourself to do something about it, and um, you know. <laughs> and to cut a long story short, we got to a place where we we, we created that that group, um, and and yeah, it's it it was purely about providing a platform for a different set of people to be able to have a voice back into UK government, into industry, and also, um, and I think you know, I mean, it, it was successful to the point that we had a cabinet member of David Cameron's government, Chloe Smith MP, that was a, an honorary member of, of, of the group and gave us her time in terms of listening and allowing us to hear what the government was doing at the time. And, you know, I think that was just sort of testament to how well that came together. And Chloe Smith was, I think, one of the, if not the youngest ever cabinet member, I believe. I may have to double check the stats, but she was definitely, mm. definitely young for what she was doing in the government at the time. And I think in terms of an output, and this is a great thing, and I do have to give give you both praise, is you know, the AAC Hive is exactly the type of thing that needed to emerge to bring people together. So I do you know, I, I applaud you to be putting that together. It's um, what I see is 
you're sort of taking on the next phase of how we're going to bring people together well, well done yeah. for taking on that Thank challenge you. it's it's and i appreciate the difficulty it's not an easy thing but i definitely feel like you're making good progress with it you like when you look at it, innovation and advancing the adoption of technologies and and other things it's about engaging with maybe what you what would be seen normally as the fringe to the core industry you know, people like software developers and and you know people who sort of sit outside that industry but who have got incredible things to contribute and, and john i mean you somebody who kind of had a foot in both worlds i mean you had a, a foot in the world of architecture and then now firmly implanted in software development and you know to this particular sector what do you think attracts the, f the people on these fringes to to draw closer to the industry i'll leave that with me ralph i might get to okay. that in the next podcast all right and um, one thing that i did yeah. want to come come back to if, if you don't mind is i have a, a bee in my bonnet about all of the research and focus on future technologies and future ways of doing things and you know you you referred to the the burly men overseeing drawings i just wanted to stop and say well maybe that's what the industry is like it is that and there seems to be as alan waha would call the bim church where we're all outliers and we're really the outliers um in the industry where we're you know, patting each other on the back saying, yeah, great, great job, you know, uh, really in interest in innovative stuff with digital twins and connecting objects and IoT sensors and processes. And like you talk to people in the industry and they're lost, you know, it's completely foreign, you know, and our, our position as with BIM Launcher as a dead integrations platform, we're speaking with the industry on a regular basis. The industry is currently still focused on documents and drawings and, you know, submittals and RFIs and approval processes and all of these really useful tools to the current industry. And I suppose this is where I'd like to bring you in, Neil, is that the CDBB and like, you know, the research that you're doing on digital twins, I mean, it's it's a bit far out, right? It, like, when do you actually think that the value um, that of the research that's been done there will actually impact our construction sites? And do you think that, like, I know that from my experience, especially that it seems to be the larger organizations that have their budgets, that have the, the people that have the interests to really, you know, push the boundaries in terms of you know, innovation, as we would call it. But I mean, what about the other 90% of the industry? Or, you know, that's a that, that figure is pulled out of the sky 90%. But I can imagine it's it's somewhere there, thereabouts. At what stage do you think that we'll have crossover of value in the research that we're doing around things like some of the things that you were talking about, like construction platform and configurators going to mm. like, you know, being, a, being able to configure a building and press deliver or developing workflow automation, that kind of thing, which would also fall under the under the umbrella of interoperability. When do you think the average guy or the average burly builder will actually benefit from this? It's a good question. There's two parts to it. So one is the, the story arc of the twin is going to be closer to the story of essentially how the internet came about and how it works so there's the uh, and that's purely based on you know let's assume that essentially digital digital twins is a just an extension of internet technology so a lot of the hard stuff about connecting the world together in a network albeit with wires or without that problem's kind of done it's more of well how do you tie things to that um which is easier and cheaper to achieve so I think from that perspective, and the interesting thing is the starting point with that, and if you look at the people that are doing things in that space there, they're looking at operational issues of assets and things that are already running and how do you make them perform better. Most of the stuff that we've got from a developed economy perspective is built. And we actually, 
when you look at the numbers in terms of how we add to that asset base is actually quite small in comparison. So I think the focus is going to be more in that space than the construction space. I think from a <laughs> the Burley Builders perspective, I'm I'm torn because on one hand it feels like progress has been quite slow, but then on on the other hand, you know, an old school friend of mine runs a duct fitting company down the road in Essex. You know, employs a handful of people. You know, no more, no more than I think. I think if you got the the other the average number of employees by firms is probably about eight. So with, with that, you know, is you know maybe employs fifteen people. And six months ago, in the middle of a pandemic, you know, they they employed a bin manager. Yeah, you know, this is you know this is a member of the you know we talk about the tail end of the the long tail of the industry. This is this is a company that would sit. You know, stereotypically right at the end of that long tail you know they do a very specific thing they do duct fitting um and they have a bin manager i mean i mean this has only happened six months ago so i think we've we've reached a tipping point in terms of that requirements around and this is more of a build i think i think this is more of a building services coordination problem thing but there is a complex dealing with the complexity cheapness of the technology and the need to um you know, there's there's some you know, clients are asking for some form of handover requirements of information that is that is churning the industry at that level. So I think it's it's happening and it's just only hit the tipping point. So if we if we look at going back to the internet, for example, I'd say that we've reached a tipping point with the internet to the point of like websites are kind of on their way of being obsolete because I just think about my interfaces with the internet. If I need to find out information about something, I don't generally go to people's websites. It's either through some form of social media or I'm using um, or I'm consuming a, a, a data streaming service, albeit Spotify, Netflix or something. If I measured my usage of megabytes per day, you know, most of it's consuming a service. It's not looking at websites. If I looked at my internet activity 10 years ago, it would have been more heavily through you know looking at websites and what have you and i think we've got the we've got we've got a similar thing here where it's sort of the we're going through this next phase of of change where the bot the um i don't want to call it the bottom end of the industry it's the, it's the other end of the long tail that you know they have their smartphones with them you know the pandemic's gonna have caused them to have to take on a lot of tools and they'll start looking at their internet banking the access that they've had to communication with their family and say i want that stuff for my work life where how can we do that and i think i think that's only just happening so i think it's for some of us that have been on the the other end of that it's it's it has been really difficult i mean every job i've had that's been about applying information management techniques has been incredibly difficult it's i'm not going to sugarcoat it it's really difficult and still is really difficult i feel that we've been plugging away and we're, we're reaching that momentum point i mean back back to the research piece i mean this is the interesting thing the, dichot the dichotomy of you know because there's the bleeding edge of technology from a research perspective and then there's its commerciality and there's always a gap between the two i mean that's just the mechanism of trying to find new ways of doing things and making it commercially viable are two completely different ecosystems mm. which are getting closer um and, and we might get on to that so, subject it was a very long answer to a question i'll pause there <laughs> yeah mm. well i think what a point that you, you made which i think resonates is this changing of the mindset from producing information to consuming information you know so people are thinking about information more about like what can the information do for me rather than what do I need to put on my website? What do I need to make available to others? Mm. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point because when we coming back to one of your earlier points about communication, yeah, that's that's really when people yeah. start asking that question, how is this? How is information going to make my job easier? You know, make my life better. You know, what can the information do for me? That that changes the the game, doesn't it? It's, mm. it's not about it's Tick, ticking boxes anymore now it's getting value yeah and you know one of the core things and I, I said it at the beginning was about there is a i don't want to say market failure but there's a 
commercial aspect in terms of if we look at you know some of the data that we the industry is being asked to manage you know we're still as you know um, as, as john was saying we're still providing paperwork to to people you know the, the the control mechanism is still the drawing still today hasn't changed mm. we're trying yeah. to and it creates this an expectation of industry to be altruistic about its handing over the data until you can uh, I, I suppose if you want to take the if you want to take the capitalist view of it it there has to be a some form of value applied to that for people to want to 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 share it to produce it to worry about my five megabytes of data now is worth nothing to me here but it's worth a hundred pounds to somebody in the future like that that has that loop has to be closed somehow i think my analysis on on what you've what you've said about your shift from websites to social media and netflix is i think you're bang on there and i think that in a roundabout way you've kind of laid the path for this evolution of the birdie builder to the way that they consume uh, information and I think that what's really going to normalize it for them is that and then this is something that I've you know I've identified with my friends and family that are in construction is you know they're a product of society and and obviously they all have smartphones and and like you Neil they've they've moved that they, they're shifting from this idea of you know viewing websites to um, consuming data streams and I think that's what will normalize this change from like you know these static drawings to um, other forms of information and um, that's been streamed to them like you could have that let's take that guy that's burly middle-aged guy who has been in the industry for 30 years and and obviously has some knowledge uh, about how things work and most of that knowledge is, is is in his head and he can go out to site every day and sort of use that knowledge and yeah it's 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 linked to him as an individual and the amount of time he can put it or, or in this well this is actually quite possible today you could put that guy in a chair with some technology strapped to his head <laughs> and his arms and he could be communicating with 10 separate people younger people who are on site and so you could effectively apply that knowledge through technology and through the channels into 10 or 20 or even 30 sites in one day yeah and so that's where technology could to yeah. could take the knowledge of that person capture it and distribute it uh, in a much more productive way than one person could could do with eight hours in a day and 20 years of knowledge uh, and it also means at the same time as distributing the knowledge he's is bringing 20 30 people up through their own learning experience mm. uh, so that when he retires in five years time that knowledge isn't lost to the industry you know so that this is all possible today through existing technologies it's not sort of well, futuristic it, it <laughs> yeah, and this is, I think, and I think the, the fun, the fundamental thing for me in terms of what's actually going to change the interface with the building site is let's let's look at the price of robotics. You know, it's it's crashing heavily. You know, um, what they call collaborative robots. You know, a, a robot that will mimic someone's arm. You know, we, these things are reaching thousands of pounds. They are no longer hundreds of thousands, um, and once they reach a certain price point uh, and the way i the, the, the analogy i like to use is to imagine you know we had screwdrivers well we probably had nails and hammers and then we had screwdrivers then we had power drills and then sort of the next step on from that is the what could the collaborative um robot that would be um you know and this isn't this isn't the automation of labor as when people think about the application of robotics in the workplace this is more of augmenting the human capability it still you know still needs to be it needs input information and needs to be deployed and looked after and i think that really interesting it is another tipping point here there's the that that whole dimension of automation i mean we, we're at a point where you you know i, I can imagine in and I'm, I'm talking like five to ten years time that these collaborative robots will be available in b and q and 
you know you might have one you might have one in your home that does multiple pieces of work or you might um just just hire one and it will paint and do some some level of of work and and at, and at that point when you're applying um and this is not blue sky thinking i've done um a lot of my work before joining cdbb was around applying robotics in complex environments and it's quite interesting when you actually implement this stuff the impact that it has on the operators and we've got the frontline worker is quite interesting because you're you don't say to the person oh bye bye here's a machine it's this machine knows nothing about what you do how yeah how do we go about getting as you say the everything that's in your head and how you go about doing things how do you get that machine to to do that and that's the next step is that um is is, is doing that because obviously machines their knowledge is perfectly replicable um and redeployable and um and and and, and what have you and i think i think that's then will drive a different kind of information economy because you won't you won't be making drawings for people to have instructions to then have to put it together it's like well my machine needs to know these things for it to do the thing i need it to do i need that information not all this other information and all of a sudden it it flips because i think the other the other dimension of of this in terms of our information our information flow from an industry perspective um, yeah, think about this. There, there was a time when tendering for work, the amount of information um, that you'd receive as a t as as a respondent to a tender would be limited by what you could send in the post. You know, if you could fit in an envelope, or you know, and then it moved the discs. It might turn up in the post on a disc, and that kind of gave some sort of limit. But with the digital age, and I don't know, you know, for you that for everyone that um, receives tender documentation. I mean, for the amount of time that we're given, for the amount of information that's supplied to respond, especially if, and it's all human documentation, right? It's just doesn't work. You know, you can't cover all the requirements. You can't do anything clever with it. So it's the, you know, we, we kind of get to go full circle to understanding well, what flows of information need to go where to make particular types of decisions. And that's, I think that's the thing that's really key. Because I just think about, I remember I did a piece of work with the fit out industry sector. A mm -hmm. trade body with a chap called David Fries and Foodie Repo when I was at Balfour Beatty looking at, you know, how can we deal with that problem? We called it, we called, the project was called Bid for Free. Is there a way that we can minimize the cost of the respondents to bids? Because, you know, if you speak to your average person in the industry, the average, you know, the average person being a person that works for a company that has five to 10 people in, you know, they, they have to spend their weekends doing invoices and inquiries, right? You know, how, how can you focus on streamlining that because that will drive the information requirements oh. is, is 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 those types of things and that's when these people will sit up and you turn and say to them, what i don't have to spend my sunday mornings doing invoicing and and inquiries Sorry. and estimating bloody hell yeah i'm i'm signed up anyway <laughs> i rest well, my case is, is, is that, well that doesn't that mean then we should be first focusing on human to human communications before we go to human to machine communications i mean is it maybe that a lot of research is too focused on the the, the machine you yeah, know the robots and the drones and the and, and nobody's like saying like how can we improve this human to human communication uh, i don't think it's technology? quite the, the focus should be so for example if we look at if we look at what's happened in the music industry i mean the commercial model for music is broken we'll just park that for a moment but mm. you know when they were creating Spotify, I don't think they were thinking in those terms. I think they were, you know, and I'll make an assumption here. They were purely thinking on like, how can you just gain, give people access to all of all of the music? So I think it's it's less about the focus of who's communicating with who, but more of what are we making easier? Like think about the functionality, the functions, the mm -hmm. the needs that we need to address. And then you can make a decision about what are the best bits for people and people to do and what are the best bits for machines to machines to do and mix yeah. that equation around but it's the you know, well, it's it, the, was it, using your music analogy i mean is is the the thing that changed it was the distribution the distribution was slow in other words you had to go buy a, re a record or you had to buy a cd or you had to buy a dvd or whatever people used to make tapes and <laughs> or you'd have to wait for your favorite song to come onto the radio and then you know that that just changed because suddenly distribution of music was just 
a floodgate. You could pick any song you wanted, listen to it any time you wanted it, and not <laughs> not necessarily. You could you can think of like LimeWire. I don't know whether that was a thing. Neil, yeah, yeah, yeah. That came before the pre, like the what's that word prevalence of you know so the peer the peer to peer networking stuff is yeah like that's that so this is so this is so this is so you're on you're on you're on to something there because and this is my this is this is my favorite thing so I've, i i get into talking about this all the time so apologies for if i'm if i'm repeating myself so one is you can't digitally distribute digital music until you've recorded it digitally so i think our industry is in the like we're trying to think about digitally distributing design when we're not we haven't quite cracked the the digital production of design yet uh, so that's the thing that's unhelpful and i think that's a root cause of some of your um some of the things that you was worried about john in terms of the, that gap and that gap is you've got people that are like we're gonna go and build a spotify and like those people need tapping on the shoulder and go oh by the way um can we just work out how to record the music digitally first and then the whole spotify <laughs> thing will just be much easier <laughs> Um, and then the interesting thing that happened in between those things was the whole Napster LimeWire peer-to-peer networking thing. It, and I think that's well, that's that's an interesting well, phase for I, our industry to go through. Is that when it does happen, there's this weird ignition point of when the business model kind of starts spluttering, which is kind yeah. of already is, but for completely different reasons. But because it's the whole race to the bottom, minimum margin stuff. But um, that's an interesting phase. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. No, well, like well, I, I think that I, I don't think we're far off from digitizing design. I mean, you know, like BIM, as I see it, is you know, it's putting the design information in electronic format that people can slice and dice it pretty quickly. So, if you did, I mean, I know there's contracts contracts that are getting in the way of this and and sort of traditional processes. But if you did distribute the design to a tendering contractor in a digital format like BIM. That contractor could conceivably take pieces of the design and send it to seven, eight, nine, ten different contract subcontractors, but just the piece that they're interested in that subcontractor tendering on. So you're not making the subcontractor go through five thousand drawings. You're saying, look, you know, I can I can quickly divide this model into the different packages because it's all digital, and I can send the ten packages out. And let the people f- focus on just the element that they have to do, and then so like none of that is impossible at the moment. If if people used BIM correctly and not used it as a tool just to produce drawings, but uh, use it as a, a a way to capture design information in in a digital format. What's getting in the way, I suppose, of of all of that is we have a contract that says you will deliver 20 copies of the drawings, and so people are using the technology as a way to produce um, 20 PDFs, 20 copies of the PDFs. And this is, and, you know, I know we're jumping around the analogies, mm. but it's the it's the queryability of of data is the thing that we need to chase. So the the work, you know, when we talk about the the what's happening in the current space in terms of digital twins and the research share, that that's about the query ability. How how do you structure? It's it's sort of beyond the structure of data. How do you structure the naming of things for a machine to be able to search it? Is the key bit. That's that's the thing that Google cracked. Right. That's why Google's so mm-hmm. popular. Is that it? it yeah. You know, before before Google and other search engines, you know. We, us three would have had websites and the only way that I would have known that your website existed is if we had a personal connection you emailed me and I knew where you or I saw a poster you know, in terms of searching the internet it was just not possible and I think that's kind of where we are from a uh, an industry perspective you know we're all we're all working out how to build our websites we haven't quite got into the world of you know because you think like so Google search came along and then that then that sort of triggered search you know, search engine optimization tools where you know, um, websites required to have some level of metadata and searchability about them for people to find them. And there was a commercial, and obviously there's a commercial imperative for that, right? Because if you can't be found on Google, how are you going to be found to then sell your service or or, or whatever? So I think that's the sort of to tie a, a loop around that. That's that's the that's the key focus of the work is about. The searchability. So, t- so tell us a little bit about your current work with the Digital Twin Fan Club and the the, the Center for Innovation 
the Centre Innovation Hub visit um, and how it's addressing some of these these challenges and maybe at the same time maybe give the listeners a, a you know just where they need to go to or what they should do what they should join what what they should follow <laughs> yeah I, I i'll keep it I'll, I'll, I'll keep it simple from that perspective you know there's the the national digital twin program has created a thing called the digital twin hub and its creation is is it's very similar to the, what you've created with the AC Hive. Is, a, is you know, can can we get the practitioners in that space to go to one place to have information around you know, anything from you know, there's a forum there with people playing with ideas all the way through to case studies, and you know, there's there's client organisations on there that have you know registered their interest in terms of you know the problems that they're trying to solve and being connected with with people and what have you so and the best thing is to and this and this is with anything from an innovation perspective like le, like we're in a world of like learn by doing you know there isn't there isn't really a course that you can go on just just go and get involved with the community and learn with everybody else and you know we, we have to start creating a culture where we can be more honest about where we are, you know, move away from the rhetoric around marketing material and trying to be shout about how, you know, all the vaporware and the slideware that, um, you know, that, that causes a lot of problems for, you know, I, I, I could imagine, and please correct me if I'm wrong, wrong here, John, yeah, I've worked with lots of small companies that get frustrated by, some of the marketing activities by bigger companies because you know you're tr- you you've got something that works and you have to battle against a much bigger machine and it makes it difficult to innovate in the space because you know that that gap between the rhetoric and reality is quite big you know how do we how do we close that and, that, and all of all of what we're doing is about you know closing gaps of for people that are trying to do focus work in this space and maximize the impact of it you know some of that stuff is government funded and has to have impact because you know for every pound spent on what we're doing is a pound not spent on nurses, right? So we have to make sure that that is 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 making an impact. But on top of that is making sure that if you know if we're going to have five clients that are going to invest a million pounds into something, you know, can we make those five clients spend half a million pounds each and do it together? You know, it's and all that type of stuff. So that's a key. You know, get over to the, the digital twin hub and get involved from from that perspective. And the CIH, what's that? The Construction Innovation Hub is um, as part, it's in an interesting phase from a fo- program perspective. So, in terms of its original funding cycle, it's in, it's got 18 months left on the program, and the next 18 months is purely about you know uh, showing what we've been up to, going out to industry and talking about that, and feeding requirements into different types of procurement activities. So, for example, are we if we're going to try and build schools with a platform construction system, being able to supply the Department of Education with the, you know, they need to have certain requirements and specifications in how they procure this. How do we how do we enable them to go to market and ask the market for modern methods of construction? So the next phase is essentially about how do we, you know, f- for the departments that are mature enough to go to market for these types of, um, I say innovations, it's not quite, innov- I, I know it's the construction innovation hub, but I think it's more about this, this two sides of the coin. One is enabling buyers of this stuff to buy things in a smarter way. Um, and then the other side of that coin is just making sure that the, yeah, those things can't be so smart that the supply chain can't deliver on them. So it's going on a, a dual journey, and I suppose uh, innovation in procurement is is also innovation. It doesn't have to be technology. Abs- <laughs> abs- abs- ab- yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Innovation can be process yeah. innovation as well, and this is and this is and this is the this is the focus. You know, we can't we can't stop building schools to go and work out how to build prefabricated schools. Yeah, you know, still like we like the most important things that we get the schools done and just balancing the the need to get it done with. Being able to change it, and that's and that's one of the things that I've learned in my my career is that you know I'm in, I'm incredibly impatient, and I want to get this you know I want to get these things moving, and I I get frustrated when we get met with some of the you know some of the the forces that slow us. I don't want to say traditional. It's just it's just that like processes are in place to in order because at the end of the day you know you only have to look at the schools in Scotland where some of the facades failed is. If we cut corners in this industry, people die. Yeah. yeah. So we have to balance it with that integrity around making sure that 
you know, we're making it as safe to build, safe to live in, safe to work in, and all that type of stuff as well. So it's mm. it's definitely a balance out there that's that is is necessary. Yeah, fantastic. Well, look, we've um, we've come to the hour, and John, I don't know if you have any final questions or final thoughts you want to. No, not that's going to fit in in the remaining <laughs> minutes that we have anyway. Yeah. We're happy to go, to go to go again sometime. Neil, yeah. are you on Clubhouse? Do you know what? You organised the Clubhouse a little while ago, didn't you? Yeah, we Is regularly organise yeah, them now, so once a week at least. I didn't know it existed until you did one, because then you did one, and then I can't remember, somebody messaged me and said, mm. it's in this Clubhouse thing. And then in one day, I went from not knowing what Clubhouse was to about six people messaging me about Clubhouse, and like I had to go <laughs> and find out this thing. Looks interesting, looks like fun. Maybe when you've next got one yeah. and, the, and the timings allow it try and jump in great well neil from from my side as well this has been a fascinating talk and like all these talks we have um you feel they could just go on and on because it's just interesting stuff and it's always amazing to talk to people who are as i said earlier has have innovation in their blood and are just spending their careers and their lives pursuing so it's, it was great to talk to you and to listen to you. So well, thank you. You thanks too. from my side. And um, any parting words of wisdom for the audience? Or my my things always try and keep it simple because and you know I've, and take it from someone that's learned from making things really complicated previously. Like just keep it simple. What can't be solved by minimum five, absolute maximum ten people in a room is going to be too difficult to solve across like a like a week so you know get you know, get people together keep it simple keep the group small and you'll be able to make progress that's my that's my hot take for anyone <laughs> listening well great um we appreciate your time very much and yes we definitely want to keep the conversation going so cool um so thanks for your time and hope you have a good weekend you too take care bye